Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our Hanawa Bay Education Program, Hanama Talks. Um, tonight, I have Hope Blanco from the NOAA Hawaiian Monk Seal Research Program. And she'll be presenting Pearl and Hermes Reef, Seal, Paradise, or Arrow. Um, she actually pre-recorded this talk, um, so if you guys can keep you guys' questions till the end, um, and we will have a short question and answer session at the end of her presentation. And um, if you guys can mute your guys' microphone as well as turn off your cameras during the presentation, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, it will make the presentation go a lot smoother. So um, without further ado, I'm going to share the presentation and you guys all get back and enjoy. And if you guys have any questions, um, Hope has put her contact info in the chat. Um, so um, please make sure to check that out. And she'll be here to answer any questions at the end. So it also isn't working. Hi, everybody. My name is Hope Bronco. Um, my internet connection isn't strong enough to present live, so I'm pre-recording for you. The video also isn't working as I'd hoped, so I added this picture of me um, so you can see what I look like right now. So, like I said, my name is Hope. I work for NOAA's Hawaiian Mungso Research Program, which is part of the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center here in Hawaii. I'm employed as a research and logistics technician for the program through the Joint Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Research, also known as JIMAR. So in my current role, I'm the operations lead for our program. I coordinate complicated logistics to support our work, and I oversee our gear, equipment, and boats. Prior to this role, I have six field seasons working with the program and a handful of other remote island experiences with some of our partners here in Hawaii. Most recently, in 2019, I led a team of four out at Pearl and Hermes Reef, and I'm here to let you decide if it's the pinniped paradise it appears or is the population in peril. More on that soon. Um, I wanna acknowledge my co-authors on this presentation, Thea, Jason, and Stacy. And of course, my 2019 team who provided many of the photos that I'm going to show you today. All pictures, research, and recovery activities were conducted under National Marine Fisheries Permit 16632 unless otherwise indicated. Finally, Pearl and Hermes is located in the Hawaiian Archipelago as part of the pop So, first, let's look at the current status of Hawaiian monk seals. You may have seen some of the following information at Thea Johannes' presentation at the 2020 Hawaii Conservation Conference a few weeks ago on signs of a fragile recovery for Hawaiian monk seals. You know, if you're not interested in looking at the data, please feel free to stare at this very cute monk seal pup instead. If you are interested in the data, the range-wide abundance of monk seals in 2019 was estimated to be 1,428 individuals. Um, you can see on the graphs there, it's about a 95% confidence interval shown. Um, so this year's number was very similar to 2018. There's an estimated 1,437 individuals, similar confidence, confidence intervals. Um, so as Thea's presentation title implies, these numbers indicate an overall positive trend. Um, 2013 to 2019 with an estimated growth rate of about 2% a year. It's important to note that this is a fragile recovery. There are many threats to monk sales, both known and still emerging. Um, so this graph on the right only shows a handful of years. Before that, we didn't have as much data for the main Hawaiian islands and locations like Nihoa and Mokumanamana, so we didn't consider the numbers that we had to be range-wide. All right, so. Here's what the 2019 range-wide distribution looks like. On the right in the green seal, you can see the number of seals in the main Hawaiian Islands is estimated at 343 individuals. Um, this is a small population, but it's growing. There were a record number of 48 pups born in the main Hawaiian Islands in 2019. Um, on the left, you can see in the pinkish seals, estimates for our eight study sites in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, and those are part of the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Overall, the numbers are about um, 1,100 and show some signs of recent increases. Um, the seal in red, darker red, is Pearl and Hermes. Um, we're going to come back to that. 
So you can see the boundary of the monument here shown in white on this map. Um, unfortunately, I know it looks like some of the seals are entangled, but I couldn't find a way to really show the numbers in these seals otherwise. Um, and so entanglements in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are not uncommon, so I have decided to just go with it. So how do we collect data on Hawaiian monk seals? Where do we get the numbers so we can estimate these abundances? In the main Hawaiian Islands, shown here on the right and green, we rely mostly on reports from the public and partners to collect data. Um, and what about our more remote sites? This is where we have the NOAA Protected Species Assessment and Recovery Camps. So the Hawaiian Monk Seal Research Program deploys teams of two to four at five sites within the monument, um, within the Papahanaumokuakea Kea Marine National Monument. Um, and you can see these sites indicated here in orange. Um, we have French Frigate Shoals, or Lalo, Kamole, which is Laysan Island, Kapo, or Lysiansky Island, Manavai, um, Pearl and Hermes Atoll, you'll, call, you'll hear me call it Pearl and Hermes Reef, same thing. Um, and then our last camp is up at Curiatl, or Holani Ku. Um, so the, these field sites are only accessible by ship and can take anywhere from two to 10 days to reach from Honolulu. Our teams are deployed to the islands for three to five months where they camp um, with no resupply. So we also work closely with partners at other sites. At Midway Atoll, we work with US Fish and Wildlife Service to collect data on seals. And we also work with the Department of Land and Natural Resources, the Division of Forestry and Wildlife teams that are deployed year round at Curie Atoll. During our research cruises, we also typically conduct single day surveys at Niihau, Nihoa, and Mokumanamana Islands and Midway Atoll, as indicated by the awkward binoculars here. All right, so field camp research objectives. Here's the general research objectives for monk seals at our camps. This includes tagging and measuring of weaned pups. You can see um, one of our teammates applying a tag right there, an orange. Um, we also work to identify all individual seals. Um, we do this often through conducting systematic beach counts across all sites. Um, we document births, deaths, and injuries. We also collect specimen and other samples from the seals. Um, and we spend a lot of time mitigating threats to seals. As you can see on the bottom left, sometimes they're a threat to themselves. This is a wean pup playing with a hagfish trap. Um, we call them eel cones. They get stuck on their muzzles and can't get them off. So one of the things we often have to do is pluck those right off their little noses. Um, we also do things like translocate seals from areas of low survival to high survival. And that can be you know, across an atoll or between field sites. Um, one of the other projects we have is vaccinations. Um, we vaccinate Hawaiian monk seals against morbillivirus. It's something similar to measles in humans or canine distemper in dogs. Um, monk seals don't have any natural immunity to morbillivirus. So if there were to be an outbreak here, it could be catastrophic for the population. Um, so vaccinations are very important. Um, other things we do, not shown here, we remove marine debris. You guys know what a threat it can be to seals that can get entangled. Um, and then each year we also have other special studies. Sometimes that can be seal vocalization studies or even things like bird surveys or lay sand duck surveys out on lay sand. Field camp life. So what's it like out here? At our field camps, each person gets their own personal tent, which you can see here on the left. Each camp also has one kitchen and one office tent. Um, you can see an office tent here in the middle. We use solar systems to provide power for our computers and other electronics. Communication is limited to satellite phones and inreaches. Um, we can use voice calls, but we primarily communicate through data calls that can transmit text-only emails. Cooking is done on propane stoves. And we also have a dorm-sized propane refrigerator and a small solar freezer. You can see here on the far right is a long drop. And above that, one of our field teams enjoying a really lovely sunset. On the bottom is a picture of our whole 2019 camp. You can see me in the foreground on the left. Um, the first two tents, which are a little bit bigger, again, are the kitchen and office tents. Um, and the four behind that are personal tents. We bring in all our supplies for three to five months, packed mostly in buckets. 
Um, we bring mostly non-perishable foods, and we also bring in all of our own water. You can see those in the blue jugs. So let's jump ahead to Pearl and Hermes. Pearl and Hermes is known for its brilliant blue waters, tiny islets with these white sand beaches, and a protected lagoon in the center with over 200,000 acres of colorful coral habitat. Here you can see the different islands within the atoll and the channels to get into the island on the bottom. We live on Southeast Island and we transit via small boat to the other islands to conduct our work. In yellow, you can see the path that we generally take from southeast to get up to north and little north islands. Um, and the bottom in orange, you can see our path that takes us from southeast island to and from bird grass and seal kittery. Um, as you can see in the video, it's beautiful. The blues are like nothing I've ever seen before in my life. Um, I want to note that this map I drew on here by hand, so this is not GPS coordinates. First, we're going to check out Southeast Island. Um, this is where we set up our primary camps during the summers. You can see it's aptly named. It's located on the southeast end of the atoll. Um, most of the islands within the Papahanaumokua Kea Marine National Monument do not have creative names within the atolls. They tend to be things like sand or east. Um, and you'll see Pearl and Hermes is pretty consistent with that. So you can see from the bottom of this um, slide our camp looking inland. Um, again, the left two tents are our kitchen and office tent, and then the four on the right are personal tents. Mine is the one on the far right, it's the messy one. Um, we moor our boats right offshore. Um, there's a really cool mooring system we can use to pull the boats in so we don't necessarily have to get in the water to get to them. Um, so back to the island map, check out that lagoon in between those two lobes of island of the island. Um, this is a relatively safe and protected area, and I'm going to talk more about it later. All right, next stop on this tour, um, we're going to talk about North and Little North Islands. Again, aptly named, um, North Island also often has several it's extending off its south end. You can't really see them in this map. Um, and then Little North is its own little spit off of North. We consider it a separate island. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle of that. Um, this is the primary pupping site for monk seals in 2019. Um, and I just want to note from a personal standpoint, these islands are particularly beautiful. All right, so we're gonna jump down south. Um, here you can see the Southern Islands at Pearl. We're not gonna talk about them much in this presentation, so I stuck them all together. Starting from the left, we have Seal Kittery Island, then grass and little grass. I put it in quotes because it is technically a spit and not its own island. Um, question mark Island, um, Bird Island, can't really see it's so small in there, and then back to Southeast on the far right. Um, the bottom right picture here is question mark island. Is this sand island? Is this peanut island or pretzel island? Something else maybe? If you know, please email me. I included my email there. <laughs> so what the heck is going on at Pearl and Hermes? You know, so the Hawaiian Monk Seal Research Program has existed since the early 1980s, and for about the first half of its existence, it focused almost entirely on these six sites shown here in pink, starting at French Frigate and moving northwest. Um, this is where nearly all the Monk Seals res uh, resided, and these sites have these semi-isolated populations of up to a few hundred seals with limited haul-out areas. What that means is that during our seasonal field camps, the seals can be surveyed regularly and identified using flipper tags or other markings like unique scars. Also, because field efforts in these sites typically spans most of the reproductive season, which is also in the summer, we can get a direct tally of the number of pups born. Um, Pearl and Hermes is shown here in a slightly darker pink, and we're going to go look at the other five sites in pink to compare. The main Hawaiian Islands is a whole separate kettle of fish, um, kittery of seals maybe, 
but I'm not going to get into that today. And both Nihoa and Mukumanamana have more limited data sets that make them a little bit trickier to compare. All right, so if we go back to those six main sites in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, you can see abundance by site here. These graphs have very different scales and variable patterns. Um, so that big range-wide decline we saw on the last slide was primarily driven by significant decline at French frigate shoals, which used to be the largest subpopulation. Um, that's shown here in orange. Um, you can see that the population is sort of coming back up, so that's a good sign. I didn't want to put it in green, so I thought orange was the best color. Um, the good news is that there's some recent signs of increase everywhere, except Pearl and Hermes, of course. Um, it's shown here in red with a sad face. So I'm not going to get into this too deeply, but using birth and survival rates and some other information, we can look at population trends over time. So here what we calculated is called an intrinsic, intrinsic growth rate. Um, it's looking at each of the islands for 2017 to 2019. Um, anything over one is good. That indicates the population is potentially increasing. Um, anything under one is bad. So here you can see Pearl and Hermes, again, outlined in red, sad face. All right, so looking at juvenile survival. Um, post weaning survival is actually up at French frigate shoals. So if you know anything about French frigate shoals, that's kind of exciting news. Um, unfortunately, post weaning survival is down at Laysan, Pearl, Midway, and Curie, started about two to five years ago. And it's resulting in these in gaps and these funky looking age structures. So you can see those with these little red stars indicated here. Um, and if you look at Lysiansky in green, Lysiansky is actually what we want to see. Um, again, looking at pearl and red, sad face. We're not really sure what's going on here. Um, we don't know what's causing this different um, rates of survival. And we don't really know why Lysiansky, which is smack dab in the middle of the monument, has higher juvenile survival. So let's dig into monk seal threats. Across the archipelago, monk seals face a variety of threats. In the monument, primary threats include climate change, food limitations, um, sometimes competition for food, uh, entanglements, and male aggression. So with climate change, there will eventually be less habitat for monk seals. You may have seen Jason's presentation last week about how reduced habitat is affecting the seal population at French Frigate Shoals. Um, we also potentially see some issues with food limitation. In the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, there are more large predators, so there's more competition for food. Um, we generally see juveniles, especially yearlings, in pretty poor body condition. Um, sea cucumbers are not generally considered a prey item for seals, but I didn't have a better picture to show here. Um, on the bottom left, I'm sure we're all aware marine debris represents a large threat to muck seals, um, especially nets and line, which seals can become entangled and drown. Um, this pup here was safely disentangled by his team not long after this picture was taken. Um, we also see male aggression towards other seals, and that can result in injuries and sometimes even death. Um, and again, we see... All right, but first... I want to note that above all else, the safety of our teams is our highest priority in the field. Therefore, it's also very helpful to know the threats to humans studying seals at Pearl and Hermes. Um, so first, it's important to consider the tiger sharks. Um, this is probably a 12 foot shark, maybe two feet of water directly in front of our camp. Not pictured as my team lined up on the beach all together staring at this. Um, tiger sharks come to the Northwestern Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands to feed on the fledging albatross chicks during the summer. Um, so we know they're there and we just need to be really careful. We would never intentionally get in the water with seals or with seals or sharks. Um, in this case, especially not sharks. All right, next issue is bird ticks. Um, they're too small to show here. So instead here is how we prevent them from getting to us. Um, bites from these ticks are extremely itchy, but they can't get through thigh highs. Um, high numbers at Pearl and Hermes, different islands, can make field work 
challenging, um, as can being too fashionable for your own good. Finally, lace and finches. These guys are an endangered species found in high numbers at Southeast Island, and we saw a few at North this past season. We even saw a nest. Um, these guys are very small, and they don't actually represent a physical threat to humans. However, saving them from themselves is a potential threat to your sanity, um, and depending on your level of success, your research permit. All right, so what are we seeing at Pearl on the ground? Um, over the past few seasons, up at North and Little North, field teams have observed a handful of unusual disappearances of nursing and recently weaned pups. Aside from French frigate, which has its own unique set of threats, pup survival from birth to weaning in Hawaiian mug sales is generally quite high across seasons and sites. Um, at sites like Lysiansky and Curie, um, Lysiansky and Laysan that are single islands, you actually see the pups almost every day throughout the season. You know, it's somewhat less regular as they get older, but still. Um, so to have these missing So what's causing these injuries at Pearl? Our suspicion is male aggression. In Hawaiian mug sales, we generally categorize male aggression as either involving multiple males on the left here, or a single male, um, it's often repeated behavior. So again, on the top left is an image of multiple males all right, so back to Pearl. Here's some additional pictures of wean pups with wounds and injuries that we believe are sustained as a result of male aggression. These can take a lot of different shapes and colors, but they all tend to be in the same area, on the seal's back, generally around the shoulder blades. Um, and on the bottom, you can actually see a wean pup from 2019. This had a pretty significant raised area. We believe it was an abscess. And it actually ruptured on its own before we could uh, you know, intervene. So, and it began to heal and it looked kind of like this towards the end of the season. We're also seeing injured juveniles. Um, the yearling on the left has a pretty distinct raised area between its shoulder blades. And um, the yearling on the right showed up this past season, 2019, with this healed injury in the same area. Um, it didn't have any injuries when it was last seen in 2018 as a wean pup, so it was injured sometime after the 2018 season ended, but before our season in 2019 started. Here's some pictures of what we also saw in 2019 with adult females. These are three separate individuals with injuries. Um, we generally do see adult females coming back with some scratches after they wean their pups, but before they molt, um, we think that's associated with normal mating behavior. Um, however, that's not to the extent shown here in these pictures from Pearl. These females have these open wounds, um, raised areas, sometimes multiple raised areas, and extensive scratching. Um, in 2019, we also had what appeared to be a healthy nursing mom abandon what appeared to be a healthy nursing newborn pup, um, which again is just somewhat unusual. So all of this is just making us scratch our heads. You know, we tend to see male aggressors focus on younger seals, usually wean pups. So what the heck is going on here? The bottom line is that we don't really know. We need more information. So what can we do? Um, most important, first step is to document what we're seeing and monitor injured and uninjured seals. It's important to get a good assessment of what's going on with the seals at any given time, but also important to get an idea of changes over time. So for a specific animal, like you see here, we want to know when it was last seen uninjured, when was the first observation of the seal with injuries, um, and then we want to know big picture. How is its body condition? Is it fat like this guy, skinny? Um, for pups, when do they wean? Um, for larger seals, we wanna know when they molted. Um, does the seal seem alert and responsive or lethargic? Um, it can be a little hard to tell with wean pups in particular. Um, sometimes they are a little dopey like you just saw in this video. Um, so is the seal breathing normally? Is the breathing labored? Um, So what else can we do? If we have injured animals that may need more than monitoring, another tool that we have in our kit is this ability here to administer antibiotics. 
Um, we work with our veterinary team to determine if treatment is recommended, and if so, we can give antibiotics via spring-loaded pulse syringe. This video is actually from Laysan in 2018, um, but I think it's a helpful video to illustrate the administration of the medication. We sneak up while the seal is sleeping, give the antibiotic into the seal's right glute, and back away. It's relatively quick and non-invasive. So um, probably this, one of the safer options for everyone involved, both seals and humans. Another tool we have in our kit is the ability to lance and treat abscesses. Again, we work really closely with our veterinary team to determine if treatment is recommended. Um, and that might also be based on the training level of the team. So we need really, really well-trained individuals to do something like this. If treatment is recommended, we capture the animal and attempt to lance the abscess like you see here. Um, this is a really phenomenal video captured by Megan and Darren Roberts in 2015, and we use it every year to help train our teams. Um, so you can see this raised abscess here. It was about the size of a volleyball. Again, pretty consistent in size. And Darren is making you know, these incisions into the abscess because we want it to open up and be able to flush. Um, unfortunate placement of his toolkit right there, um, but doesn't matter. This is an amazing effort, and you can see the high pressure of that fluid in there releasing. Um, and you can only imagine how much better the seal must have felt after that. Um, sometimes you need to step away for a second, and that's okay. Um, the next step here, we're still going to be opening up this injury a little bit. You see that X-shaped cut we've made, Darren made. It was really perfect. Um, and then we start flushing this area with dilute betadine. Um, it's going directly in, and we're just trying to get it to break up some of that infected tissue in there. And the last thing they'll do in this video before they release the seal is give antibiotics. You've already seen us do that, so I'm not going to show you again. Um, we keep all of our handlings under 10 minutes and that the safety of the seal is the most important. So if at any point it seems like the seal is struggling, um, we will release it immediately. Another tool we have in our kit is translocations. This is quite an extensive kit, so bear with me. Um, we can move seals within the atoll and sometimes even between atolls or islands from areas of low survival to higher survival. At French Rick Shoals, they move wean pups away from islands with shark predation to turn island where it's safer, at least from the sharks. Um, so working with our program leadership and our veterinary team in 2018 and the 29 seasons, we translocated wean pups away from North and Little North to Southeast Island and released them in that lagoon that I pointed out earlier. Um, you can see our camp in this video behind us. The seal came directly out of our small boat. Um, we're transporting him in this stretcher net. It's the safest way to move um, seal wean pups of this size. Um, and then uh, the nets are generally tied off and then we open them up and allow the seal to um, exit the net. And you can see this guy is very, very happy to be back in the water. Another tool in our kit is rehabilitation. Um, I've said that a lot. We have a lot of tools. Again, just bear with us. So at the end of the season, again, at the discretion of our vet team, we can bring in compromised animals for rehabilitation at the Marine Mammal Center's Cape Caiola on the Big Island. Seals in poor shape are fattened up and released back into the wild. These two seals on the top left were brought in at the end of the 2019 season and they were actually recently released on Midway this past August after about a year in rehab. Um, we had hoped to return these two individuals to Pearl and Hermes, but we weren't able to conduct our normal field work this year um, in the monument. So that said, Midway has flights. It was the best option for us. Um, and Midway to Pearl and Hermes is not that far of a trek for a seal. So fingers crossed, maybe these two will make their way back to Pearl. You know, what else can we do? I think, you know, this might be even more important than what we can do for the pups. Um, it's to identify and monitor adult males. Um, we're looking for the individuals specifically that are causing these sorts of injuries. 
We can set up for the day at North or Little North or even camp for short time frames to monitor the situation and help to identify aggressive males. Ultimately, we want to know, is this one individual or several? Um, it's really helpful to get bleaches onto the males to make them obvious and identifiable from a distance. You can see this kind of bleach on the adult male in the right picture. Um, if we observe an interaction where a pup's life is in immediate danger, we are actually permitted to intervene and attempt to shoo this adult male away from its target. At Pearl and Hermes, um, there was one particularly baddy bad um, in 2018, that's this guy on the right, but in 2019, we didn't observe him interacting with any wean pups. So this is, can be really tricky. Um, in 2019, we did see a handful of other adult males interacting with the pups at North, but nothing to the extent that would have caused injuries. Um, the bottom line is that we really need to spend more time up at North to try to determine what's going on. If we're able to identify aggressive males down the line, we may consider moving them to another site or even bringing them into captivity like K-18. He is a baddie bad from Cary in 2011, and he now lives a very happy life away from weaned pups at University of California Santa Cruz's Long Marine Lab. You know, so what's working? Um, bottom line is it's too soon to tell and we just don't really know yet. Um, we only started translocating wean pups from north to little north, or from north and little north to southeast in 2018, and we continued those efforts in 2019. So in 2018, four of those pups were moved, and three out of four were actually seen in 2019. So not not bad. Maybe indicate some potential. Um, and the fourth pup actually had some severe injuries at the time of its translocation. So it's not really surprising it didn't survive. We didn't get it. You know, we didn't, weren't able to move a healthy pup. It was already injured. Um, so in 2019, eight pups were translocated to Southeast. So of those, two were taken to rehab and then eventually released on Midway. We just talked about them. Um, but we don't know the fate of the others because we didn't have a 2020 season. So some of our limitations out here, um, well, actually, let me talk about our veterinary interventions first. Um, the 2015 pup intervention I showed was that that pup actually survived and was observed in 2016 and 2017. Um, the, a 2018 pup with an abscess lance during the season was also seen this past year, 2019, that's DH24. Um, we observed several pups with abscesses in 2019, but they all actually self-lanced and healed on their own. Um, again, we don't really know what their fates are going to be this year. We know that our interventions helped the seals at that time, but we really don't know how these long-term injuries and subsequent interventions can affect long-term survival. Right now, we're also really limited by sample size. It's difficult to tell statistically if wean pup survival is different between the islands within the atoll. Um, there are relatively known, low numbers of pups born each year at Pearl and Hermes, and they're spread out all across the different islands, and it can be really variable between years. Um, once we're at the field sites, we're also really limited by weather. We can't boat if the weather's poor, and the weather can be really variable at Pearl, especially early in the season and later in the season. Our primary camp is at southeast, but we really need to spend more time up at the ground at north. Um, we generally only get there two to three times per week for a handful of hours, and it's not, it's just not enough. So looking forward, um, what are we doing now? We're diving into the data right now to see if we can determine if we can pull out what might be impacting survival at Pearl. There's some very, 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 very initial data suggesting that pup fatness, um, we call it girth at weaning, might be a strong indicator of survival to age one. and might be stronger than birth island or translocation status. Um, this relationship between girth and survival is consistent, is well known, it's consistent with other sites but we need to get deeper to really determine if it's truly the primary indicator of survival here. We need to look at pups individually, confirm whether they had any injuries documented or otherwise, um, even really, really small things that may not have, you know, made it into our ranking system for injuries. We're also gonna look at yearling survival and see if there were new or healed injuries um, with those guys. And we also need to look more closely at how these specific translocations affect survival. Sometimes we move animals for other reasons, so I have quite a bit of homework to do. Um, in the future, we also 
are planning to outfit a smaller second camp set up for the Pearl and Hermes team at North. Um, hopefully that'll give us more time on the ground and help us get a better idea of what's happening. We're also working on a protocol to set up remote cameras at North and Little North. These are like trail cameras. Hopefully we could see if we could detect any of these aggressive interactions um, happening when we're not on island. You know, ultimately I think it would be great if this project could end in a publication, but we may not have enough data to do that. However, once we dive into the limited data we do have, it should be enough to help us make informed decisions on how best to mitigate threats to seal survival at Pearl and Hermes. So I will leave this up to you all. Is Pearl and Hermes this pinniped paradise it appears? Um, or does it represent peril to the population residing there? Here you can see five wean pups hanging out together, playing in the shallows at North. Are these white sand beaches and turquoise waters at North and Little North still a safe playground for puppies? Maybe not right now, but hopefully they can be again. All right, thank you so much to everyone who's been helping me with this little pearl project. Um, thank you to the Hawaiian Monk Seal Research Program and to our veterinary team especially for supporting a lot of these field interventions. Um, thank you to all the previous Pearl teams and all of our field staff who dedicate their summers to supporting seal research and recovery. Um, with that, do you guys have any questions for me? All right. I did want to add, I got cut off in one of the slides, but I did have an alternate working title for this um, presentation. As you guys know now, Pearl and Hermes Reef is part of the Hawaiian Archipelago, um, part of the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And the Hawaiian name for Pearl and Hermes is Manavai. So my alternate working title for this was Manavai, Magical Kingdom for Monk Seals, or menace. Um, so I hope you guys caught all the really good alliterations and a couple puns in there. Um, you guys have any questions for me? What can I talk to you more about? Okay, so if you guys have a question, you guys can turn your guys' microphone on and ask Pope. Um, I got one though. Um, I noticed three of the slides maybe you got cut off. Was there any information that you wanted to, I guess, add that? was missed during those cutoffs. I think you're talking about the, was it detrimental lancing or something? I think there was like three slides in a row that it kind of got cut off. Yeah, um, yeah. I definitely saw the slides getting cut off. That's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that you guys got most of the big picture mm -hmm. information. So let me know if there's something that didn't make sense and I can loop you guys in. Um, okay, I see a question from Danielle. Mm -hmm. Hi, Danielle. Um, from Palmyra. Wow, I can't believe you guys can connect from there. <laughs> Great. If there's any updates on the pups released at Midway. Yes, we do have updates. Um, there is a website where we can actually go on and see where the pups are if they have tags on them. Um, several of our seals that we released, three of the four, have satellite tags. So uh, we can see some of the information live. And then we have a website uh, that you guys can go to and see with the two week delay. So you can actually check out where those seals are now. Um, at least several of them are still on Midway hanging out. And then one seal has decided to head out to Curie. So um, it's been hanging out there for the past couple of weeks. Everyone seems to be doing well. The pictures that we receive, all the pups still look really fat and happy. So it's all good news. Are there specific? Yeah. Sorry. Um, are there specific males at Pearl and Hermes that are responsible for the attacks, or is it all of them? That's a great question. It's definitely not all of them, um, but we're still trying to figure out if it's specific males or if it's one specific male. Um, I mentioned this briefly, and I'm not sure if it got cut off, but there was one known individual in 2018 who was observed aggressively interacting with a pup multiple times and likely causing injuries. Um, but this past year, we had maybe a handful that we watched and saw interacting. Um, so it's tricky, tricky to say 
What I will say is that the monk seals hang out um, at specific islets and they tend to stay, you know, in those areas. So sort of the south side of the atoll or the north side of the atoll. So we kind of have a smaller subset of individuals at the northern islands that we can keep an eye on. Um, again, we just don't really know if it's specific males yet, not enough information. All right, so question from Kathy, since we missed our 2020 season, what does this mean for our statistics and our tracking? Um, any thoughts what we might find for our next season? Yeah, great question. You know, we have been collecting data on these islands since the 80s, and this is the first year, I think, ever that we've missed an entire season at all sites. Um, we are getting some limited data from Midway, Curie, um, a short trip to Nihoa, and we hopefully will be getting some information from French Frigate on a trip leaving in October. Um, yeah, it's a little intimidating, I think, for us to miss an entire um, year of data. But because we have all this other robust data sets, uh, we may be able to sort of extrapolate. And we are hopeful that if we are able to get out next year and get a lot of this really good information, um, we won't be missing a whole lot. You know, we will still be able to tag a lot of the yearlings. They'll be yearlings now. Um, and it should be pretty obvious. But if we miss another season in a row, if things keep happening, you know, it may be a little tricky to recover. Um, next season, we aren't sure exactly what we're going to find. I expect we'll find lots of untagged little seals and um, we'll be tagging them. All right. Is there an evolutionary reason that might be motivating male aggression? For example, does it trigger the mothers in estrus or something like that as male aggression in some other mammals does? You know, it's a good question. Um, we don't, again, we don't necessarily know. This is not uncommon in other species. Um, we see male aggression in other animals like otters. Um, we don't necessarily know <laughs> what's causing it. I am not sure if this got cut off, but um, we think maybe it's because of um, the unbalanced sex ratio up at some of these islands. If the ratio is really skewed towards males, you know, maybe the males aren't getting access to the females that they are hoping to. And so there's excess males potentially and not enough of um, the other individuals. So maybe that is kind of pushing this behavior. Um, we don't think that it triggers the mothers into estrus. We believe that the moms go into estrus sometimes, sometime between when they wean their pup and when they molt. And they often come back with these mating scratches on their backs. So we're pretty confident that's the time frame. Um, and with the males, they, you know, we've looked at some testosterone studies and the testosterone seems to kind of peak in the same way that, you know, mating season does. Um, and that's, you know, sort of follows the lines of summer. So, yeah, it's it's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, Stacy put in this link to the website to watch monk seals. So if you guys want to follow them, that's their tags. Those are uh, one Pearl and Hermes seal and two Lizianski seals. Um, we did translocate two pearl seals, but one was molting when we released it, so we weren't actually able to put a tag on it. Any other questions? Anybody have any questions? You guys can turn off your mic. Turn it off. Don't see any activity. A lot of people are it looks like they're listening in on their phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, if you guys have any more questions, um, Hope has actually put her email in the chat. So um, you can um, ask her through her email. Um, and if with that, uh, thank you very much, Hope. Um, hope you guys all can tune in to next week. We have Dr. Stacy Robinson, um, and she'll be talking on the 22nd. So hopefully you guys can all tune into that talk. Uh, with that, you guys have a great night. And hope, thank you, mahalo. See you guys all next week.